I'm Demelza Carlton and I'd like to introduce you to the cursed coast of Western Australia, a place of hidden reefs and rocks where many ships have met their doom. 1914, the start of World War I. 30,000 eager young Australian and New Zealand men volunteered to join the army so they could fight for Britain. Both countries' fleets assembled in Albany, Western Australia. Five warships were to escort 38 troop transports across the Indian Ocean to Egypt so the new troops could begin their training. It was to be the war to end all wars and they wanted a part of it. They had no idea that a third of them wouldn't survive the year, with more than 10,000 men dying in Gallipoli alone. The protagonist in today's tale is called Sydney. One of the escort ships was the HMAS Sydney, a Chatham-class light cruiser commanded by Captain John Glossop. Launched in 1912 and encased in three-inch thick armour, she carried eight six-inch guns, four three-pounder guns and two 21-inch torpedo tubes, more than enough to be quite a formidable force on the water. The setting for this battle is Cocos, the Cocos Keeling Islands, two remote coral atolls in the Indian Ocean that were annexed by the British Crown by accident in 1857. How can territory be claimed by accident? I'll tell you, for it was. Captain Stephen Fremantle, the brother of the man the port city of Fremantle is named for, received orders from Britain in January 1857 to take possession of the Cocos Islands in the name of the British Crown. While there are plenty of islands called Cocos, there was only one set of Cocos Islands where he had any authority, and it was the Cocos Keeling Islands in the Indian Ocean. So he set sail for the atoll in the HMS Juno. On the 31st of March 1857, he planted the flag and named John Clooney's Ross the governor of the island group before sailing back to Sydney. It wasn't until he arrived back in Sydney that he found out his vague instructions had been referring to some other islands in the Bay of Bengal, which coincidentally were already British territory. Rather than admit their mistake, the British government decided to keep the Cocos Keeling Islands, particularly when they were identified as the perfect place for a cable station for the subsea telegraph cable spanning the Indian Ocean. The cable station was built on Direction Island in 1901, connecting South Africa via Mauritius to Cottesloe in Western Australia. A cable was also laid from Cocos to the city of Batavia, now Jakarta, which then linked to Darwin in northern Australia. As such a strategic communications hub, the staff at the Cocos Telegraph Station heard all the news. They knew how valuable Direction Island was, and when stories of a new warship in the Indian Ocean began to circulate, it was only a matter of time before they were its next target. They kept a lookout, ready to radio and telegraph for help as soon as an enemy vessel was sighted. What was their biggest fear? The scourge of the Allied navies, part of the German East Asiatic Squadron, the Dresden-class light cruiser, the SS Emden. She steamed into the Indian Ocean in August 1914. In less than two months, she sank or captured 21 vessels, including a coal ship called the Buresque, and she attacked the port of Penang. By November 1914, at least nine Allied vessels were hunting the Emden, but they found no trace of her aside from the damage she left in her wake. This one German cruiser was the reason for the troop transport's heavy escort from Albany when the convoy of ships left on the 1st of November 1914. Yes, the whole Indian Ocean was afraid of one ship. At 6am on the 9th of November 1914, a ship was spotted offshore from Direction Island. At first glance it had four funnels, like a merchant ship or an allied vessel, but she didn't have a flag. The cable staff radioed for help, saying there was a strange ship in the lagoon entrance. 
As the sun rose and the ship moved closer, it became clear that one of the funnels was false. A strange ship with three funnels, pretending it had more. There was only one ship it could be. The SS Emden. The cable station staff raced to radio for help again to anyone who could hear them, that the Emden had arrived at Direction Island, but the Emden jammed their radio signals before they received any reply. A landing party from the Emden was sent ashore to Direction Island in a steam launch and two other cutters. There were 50 men, 30 seamen, 50 technical staff and two wireless men, commanded by Helmuth von Mook and two lieutenants. Two cables were cut with axes and cold chisels. One was the cable to Perth, the other a spare length of cable. The cable crew told Von Mook that he had been awarded the Iron Cross, the first news he'd heard of it. His response was to tell them that they wouldn't be harmed. It may have been war, but it was a very polite sort of attack. The German landing party cut down the wireless mast then carefully lowered it down between the tennis courts so the courts wouldn't be damaged. They smashed the relay station machinery, but not the generator, because it also powered the ice plant. While the cable station equipment was being systematically smashed, help wasn't far away. The entire Australian and New Zealand convoy was 60 miles from Cocos, and the HMAS Sydney received the radio distress call, as well as the Emden's jamming signal. They were ordered to steam off at full speed to investigate. The crew could have breakfast on the way. The Sydney covered the distance in just over three hours, sighting the Emden off Direction Island at 9.15am. When the Emden recognised the Australian light cruiser, she headed into open sea, stranding her landing party on Direction Island. The Emden fired first, so the Sydney opened fire. A broadside from the Sydney scored them a direct hit on the Emden before another shot from the Emden took out the Sydney's rangefinder and the man operating it, cutting another man's leg off at the knee. Maybe a minute later, a shrapnel shell burst on deck, injuring seven of a gun crew of nine. Two of the men died. A piece from another shell went straight through a man's body, and he died of his wounds two days later. His name was Reginald Albert Sharp. When battle was engaged, the Emden's marooned landing party and the cable station staff settled in to enjoy the show from the best vantage point they could find, the cable station roof. The Emden hit the Sydney's control room next, wounding the control officer, while another man lost an eye. It wasn't until 10am that the Sydney managed to land a significant hit on the Emden, and the resulting explosion set fire to the ship. At 10.30 they managed to shoot out the foremast, followed by the second funnel not 10 minutes later. A lucky shot found the Emden's boilers and caused another explosion. At 11am, with three funnels gone and both the bridge and chart house blown off, the Emden started sinking. Captain Carl von Mueller set a course for the nearest land, North Keeling Island, running her aground on the surrounding reef 15 minutes later. Her opponent disabled, the Sydney found a new target on the horizon, a collier, the Buresque, that had been attacked and captured by the Emden in an earlier battle. The Buresque was a coal ship and the German prize crew didn't want the coal falling into enemy hands, so they scuttled it, opening the seacocks and smashing the spindles so they couldn't be closed. The armed boarding party sent by the Sydney discovered this when they heard it from the ship's Chinese crew, hustling everybody back to the Sydney. The Sydney fired four shots into the Buresque. She sank, still burning. HMAS Sydney returned to the Emden at four in the afternoon to find her still flying the German naval ensign flag. Not wanting to fire on an already disabled vessel, the Sydney asked the Emden three times to surrender, signalling with semaphore flags, but she got no answer and the German flag still flew. The Sydney fired one final shot into the Emden and received a response. The German flag was hauled down and a white one waved. The Sydney sent a lifeboat to the Emden, manned by the Buresque's German crew, carrying water supplies and a message that they'd return to rescue them in the morning. 
They then headed out to sea to pick up three men they'd seen swimming in the water. The poor men had been swimming since 10.30 that morning, but the Sydney reports picking up all three of them at 5pm. The Sydney stayed offshore overnight, as they'd heard, from one of the prisoners I imagine, that the German landing party on Direction Island were heavily armed and they didn't want to engage them until daylight. When daylight came, they assembled a landing party of 35 men and the officers to go ashore. They were met on the jetty by the cable station staff and no one else. The German landing party, under the able commander von Mook, had turned pirate. When neither the Emden nor the Sydney returned, they assumed the worst and decided to find their own way home. They commandeered supplies of food and water from Direction Island and loaded them into the boats, eyeing off the governor's schooner, Aisha. Telling the cable station staff they were headed for East Africa, they sailed away in the Aisha before the Sydney returned. The Sydney asked for help from the cable station surgeon. He accompanied them back to North Keeling to assist with the wounded men on the Emden. It took a whole day to transfer everyone from the Emden to the Sydney, and the conditions were pretty crowded when they were done. While the majority of the Emden crew weren't allowed weapons, for some reason the officers were permitted to keep their swords. One of the Sydney crew, leading signalman John Seabrook, described the damage to the Emden in detail. The floor of the conning tower was blown up. The chart house and upper bridge were missing, only the deck of the lower bridge remaining. The foremast was hanging over the port side. Three funnels were laying over the port side, tired, I presume. There were big holes all round the decks. Where the funnels and engine room had been was one mass of bent and twisted iron. From the main mast to right aft, there was no woodwork left, not even the wood of the decks. The fire had burnt the lot. The afterguns were blistered beyond recognition. All the officers' cabins were burnt out and it was a straight drop from the deck to the bottom of the ship. On the Emden, 134 died and 65 were wounded. On the Sydney, there were 4 dead and 17 wounded. The German dead were buried at North Keeling Island. The bodies were later exhumed and transported back to Germany. Three of the Sydney dead were buried at sea. Around 20 of the Emden's wounded had managed to get ashore on North Keeling Island, which turned out to be a terrible idea. The wounded men had been attacked by the large land crabs on the island. In case you're wondering what sort of crab attacks a man, I'll introduce you to the land crabs on Cocos. The smaller ones, about the size of two spread hands, are aptly named Cardisoma carnifex. Carnifex means butcher. And those are the little ones. The bigger ones, well, they're the same size as the tyres on a four-wheel drive and they're called robber or coconut crabs. Their claws can break through a coconut shell or a four-wheel drive tyre and take the front grill off your car. The wounded men on the island had to wait till the following morning to be rescued from the marauding crabs, but they were, and the Sydney headed to Colombo in Sri Lanka with their prisoners. They were met and congratulated by some of the New Zealand convoy ships, which were joined by the remainder of the convoy as the week progressed. The Sydney pre resumed normal duty, escorting the convoy to Aden as originally planned. For the damaged cable station, help was soon at hand. On the 16th of November, the cable ship Patrol arrived with repair gear and provisions to replace what was damaged or taken by the Emden Raiders. The cable station was operational again a week after the attack. The German landing party in the Aisha never made it to East Africa, though they never tried to either. When they left Cocos, they set a course for Padang in Sumatra. They transferred to a German freighter that took them to Yemen before making their way over land to Constantinople and then on to Germany. It took them six months. Von Mook wrote two best-selling books about his experiences on the Emden and his journey after it sank. 
The Emden was slowly picked apart by salvage crews from Cocos and Japan until January 1916 when the Emden started slipping back off the reef into deeper water until she was no longer visible from shore. She still lies there today. If you ask any Australian today about the HMAS Sydney sinking a German ship in the Indian Ocean, most would be thinking about the World War II vessel, the HMAS Sydney II. But the only part of the original Sydney that took part in the 1941 battle was the ship's solid silver bell. It was lost with the HMAS Sydney II when she sank with all hands off the coast of Western Australia in November 1941 after disabling the German vessel Cormoran, which was also wrecked in the same engagement. All the historic photos used in this video were taken before or during World War I, including many that were taken on the day of the battle or during subsequent rescue operations. The Battle of Cocos was the Royal Australian Navy's first victory at sea, but it still came at quite a cost. Loss of life from both sides lest we forget. On that sombre note, that's all for this week's Cursed Coast. Next week, on a lighter note, did you hear what happened to the ship's dog on the Devonshire? <laughs>